Good morning, good afternoon, and evening, baseball fans. Welcome back to the Barstool Baseball Show. This is Carl. It is Friday, and as always, I'm joined by Chris Castellani for what should be a great quick little roundup of some of the biggest headlines in baseball. Chris, it's good to see you. Let's start with the biggest headline right as we get into this. Heim Bloom fired from the Red Sox. Young guy, thought he'd be sticking around a little bit longer. Your instant reaction to this is a surprise you. I was surprised at first, for sure, because I, I I knew the fan base had generally been unhappy with him. But at the same time, I think that, that they were kind of victims of expectation in the sense that this has been, you know, of the 21st century, the you know, the most prolific best organization in baseball. We are talking about a team that's two years removed from an ALCS appearance. At the same time, you know, when I took a step back, I, I became less surprised by it because I think the Red Sox viewed themselves as an organization that was kind of in, in limbo. Uh, I think that they had a team at the major league level that was okay, a 75 to 85 win team, uh, com- re- relatively competitive, but not good enough to be great. And they weren't able to sell hope in the farm system the way that, say, the Orioles were several years ago, where it's like, hey, we're not great, but we got these guys coming up. It's an average farm system at best. It's an average team at the major league level at best. I think that they were afraid that they could fall into baseball purgatory. And because of that, uh, they cut ties pretty quickly. So Hub's instant reaction was, can't believe the Yankees are still hanging on to Brian Cashman. He's done much worse over a much longer tenure. Red Sox short leash. White Sox do not have one. The Cubs won't fire anybody, I don't think. But some organizations, the Red Sox too, ALE, so competitive. You don't have a choice. That fan base is up your fucking ass. I, I I wish more teams would respond as quickly as the Red Sox have. These GM positions are so much incest and such low turnover rates. There's plenty of talented people out there. Speaking of which, one of which, David Stearns, who's largely responsible for the most successful run in Milwaukee Brewers history. Four straight playoff appearances. That does not include this season. Eight seasons as a GM. It'll be five playoff appearances, three division championships. Kind of a like boy wonder genius. He was 30 when the Brewers hired him. Now the Mets if, are bringing him home. He's a Manhattan guy, went to Harvard. The Mets are bringing him home. He worked for the Mets when he got out of, I guess it was like his first job. He interned for the Pirates or something, but he worked for the Mets in 2008. And now, what is that, 15 years later, he's he's the head honcho. David Stearns, do you think the Red Sox would hire somebody like younger, like the way the Brewers went after David Stearns, or do you think the Red Sox just in comparison to David Stearns going to the Mets, like they've got to go make a huge splash now, right? I think that they're going to do everything they can to get, try to get somebody established. Now, obviously, the best name is off the market. Great move by the Mets, by the way. I mean, just the simplest solution. Went out and got their guy. I think he's going to do a fantastic job. I think as far as the Red Sox are concerned, I don't think they want a repeat of what just happened. Where let's go get what we perceive to be kind of the wonder kid, young guy, comes from a you know a, a, a small market team in Tampa. I think they're going to try to hit a home run here, no pun intended. Well, we'll see what happens, though. I, I mean, obviously, somebody, you know, guys like David Stearns, those guys don't go on trees. Um, I, I, I heard Epstein's name thrown around right away. That's not going to happen. Um, but I, I think that their their number one goal, given kind of the pulse of that fan base right now, is to get somebody who's established and not just established, but willing to spend money unlike the way that that Bloom uh, was able to do. Now, part of that was ownership. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't Bloom's fault that they traded Mookie Betts. That was that was an ownership decision. They weren't going to pay him. Um, I think a lot of this will be dependent on how much John Henry's willing to spend. But I think they're going to try to get an established name. Yeah, just in comparison, when the Brewers hired David Stearns, he had spent time as the only assistant GM under Jeff Lunau with the Astros since 2012. So I think he had five seasons under his belt. That includes some really bad years, but years where they had rebuilt the farm system and built that juggernaut. So it'd just be interesting to see what these GM moves are and the front office moves are this offseason, because especially if David Stearns is the hottest name and it's already out and he's already wrapped up, I don't know what the big speculation is. The White Sox already did their internal search. They didn't even wait till they got to the offseason. It's just seem it just it's a hard fucking spot to fill, man. And I feel like we've kicked out a ton of older GMs. I feel like you can only promote from within or the younger crowd. So like if when I say make a big splash, I'm talking about like how much money would you go pay Dave Dombrowski to be your GM right now? 
How much money would you pay? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Speaking of good organizations, the Braves, we got to talk about the Braves. Six straight division championships. They are probably the most successful organization in baseball since they raised them out. And just as comparison, they've got the most division championships in the history of baseball. The Yankees have 19, the Dodgers have 20, the Braves have 23. So if you just measure and accept a big Theo Epstein-ism, which is your number one goal out of spring training should be winning the division and having home field advantage in the playoffs. Wouldn't the Braves be considered the most successful organization in baseball history then? Uh, I would say they're the greatest regular season organization since, I think that's a good parameter since the, the they lower them out, I, I would say is a fair point. And definitely since the 90s. I, I mean, the, the fact that there has been, this is the sign of a great organization. There's been a lot of turnover. There's been multiple GMs and and different, you know, Runs of players. You have the 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 Freddie Freeman era. He's gone. You're placing with Matt Olson. Doesn't matter. The Braves are always, always, always consistent. And they've had over these last six years a lot of contenders. They've had a lot of other teams that have tried to throw their hand to the ring. The Mets had that great year last year. The Phillies obviously got to the World Series. It doesn't matter. For the 162, there is no team in baseball more equipped to win their division year in and year out than the Atlanta Braves. Some more historical context for you. They won 14 straight from 91 to 05. There's a strike year in 94. But what I love about that 14-year stretch is the first three of those division titles, they were in the NL West. And in fact, since their inception in 1969, they were always in the NL West because the first season was with the Seattle Pilots. I wish Clemmer was here to explain exactly why. But when the Braves, when they became the Atlanta Braves, they then played the, the first 24 seasons is the Atlanta Braves in the NL West traveling out to San Diego and Los Angeles? That's fucking crazy to me. But the last three years they had won the <laughs> the last three years they won the NL West, and then they went on a fourteen or they won eleven in a row for fourteen straight. And now so that's eighteen NL East titles. It's seven more than the Phillies, and the Phillies have been in the NL East for one hundred and thirty years. That's insane. That's and, and really it's. I know even, especially when you win this consistently, I think fan bases have a tendency to take it for granted. It is fucking hard to win your division, man. You need, especially consistently, you need to be healthy. You need to make sure that you have a great roster that's put together. You And you need to ensure that other teams in your division don't get crazy lucky or crazy hot. You know, like teams like the Dodgers and Braves, like I preach, do not take this shit for granted. It's really tough to do just to get there. Now, obviously they have the, all their goals in front of them. You know what they, they want to be the last team standing. But to not just win your division, but in a good division, there's a there's a there's a Phillies team in this division that's quite good. You have the Marlins who are fighting for a playoff spot to have this division wrapped up on September 13th. It just goes to show how dominant of a year that they've had. You had three weeks left in the season, about two and a half in change, and they're just five wins short of last year's total at the time of recording. We're talking about a dominant team last year that just manages to get so much better. The, at what point do they they start to trend down because they, they can get better next year and they can be better the year after that so I watched an Austin Riley in the box the other day and I could I cannot get my head wrapped around about how young he is and how polished he looks he looks like a combination between Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado tons of athleticism but a, like a robot like a, a super athletic robot and that dude's just starting the ascension of his career like Ronald Acuna is just starting the ascension Matt Olson is only getting better these players so we could be in a situation three years from now where we're talking about the team is like, I can't believe they got better than they were last year. I think it's, and I and this is a long time, I think it's legitimate to say they have, after this year, now they've already won six straight division titles. I think they have, with this core that they have locked up, a solid five years where like World Series is legitimately expectation. After that, once guys get to their 30s, you kind of worry about durability and potentially injuries, but I think... Going beyond this year, I could see another half decade in which it's their division to win and in turn potentially their National League pennant to win year in and year out. Just crazy consistency. Anthopolis has just built an unbelievable core in Atlanta. Did you see the Phillies put congratulations at NL, NL East division champions? And someone had said in the group text thread that that's common practice. I'm not familiar with that being common practice. So do the Tigers do that? I don't believe so. The last time, and I could be missing one, the last time a team clinched the division 
at Comerica Park that wasn't the Tigers. I know Cleveland won the AL Central in 2016 in a game against Detroit. I don't recall any scoreboard messaging. You know, I, it, this stuff is so weird because I really am a believer in like conduct and sportsmanship. I think that makes sports fun. But I also think that we've gone so far in the other direction where it's like, you don't have to kiss anybody's ass. You know, you don't have to, we got this little league show where they're shaking hands after a home run. Like, stop it. Like I, I the Phillies want, wanted to win the division. They didn't. I think you can lose, tip your cap, say, hey, they got us like they did last year, like they did the four previous years. I'm not crazy about it. I'm, and obviously, no, none of the players have any control over it, and Rob Thompson's not telling him to do that. But from an organizational standpoint, like, you made it to the World Series last year. You're still in this. You could play this team in October. I'm not, I, I think it puts a, an unnecessary target on your back, and you turn yourself into, like we're talking about it right now, you kind of turn yourself into the story by doing that. I don't, I don't know if it's common practice. If it is... I'm not. I'm still not crazy about it, so I don't want to single out the Phillies. But yeah, lame, lame. Makes me sick to my stomach. It really okay. does. It makes me sick. And I think this should reinforce a rule I've wanted to institute a long time, Major League Baseball, and that's employees of a club must be homegrown fans of the club. You, uh, the amount of employees for Major League Baseball teams that come in and out and transfer all over. If you work for the Cubs, you should just be, it could only be a Cubs fans. You got to live in a certain radius. You have to have like roots to the organization. Because if that was the case, I think team pride, the amount of the rivalries would shoot up. You'd see so much more shit talking, just the passion and the energy. I'm dead serious about this. You shouldn't work for the team unless you grew up loving that team. And I mean, up until you get to like front office personnel. And I understand if you got to go hire a guy from MIT who doesn't, you know, necessarily connect with the neighborhood, but open, open it up to just locals only. I don't mind that. And it's, I've had, I don't want to single anybody. I've had friends who grew up as diehard Detroit fans who now work for teams in other markets. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I feel, I feel like I'm losing you. I feel like you lost me. It's a, it's like, look, you got to fucking get money. You got to get paid. But I do get, I, I, I would love that. Like, I, I would think that would be dope. Like, if, if, if you just had Tiger fans running things in Detroit, like the kind of rhetoric we'd get, the kind of response, I think I'm down for that. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's smart guys out there that grew up Tigers fans that are working in baseball somewhere. They'll just go like to the rest of the league and be like, all right, all the ticket sales guys come home. PR people come home, go back to wherever you came from, go identify with your hometown team or some, some sort of exchange program. Now we're getting a little bit off topic here, but. It would be nice. It would be nice. I'll say that. Now, I talked a little bit about the NL East. Max Scherzer left the NL East this year. He goes to the Rangers. He makes eight starts. Six of them are very good. One of them is awful. Got his shit rocked on September 6th against the Astros. Absolutely dominant. Now, a little contract reminder here. Obviously, the news, Max Scherzer's out for the season. Will not be pitching in the playoffs. Will he be back in 2024? Yes. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay, so contract reminder. It's a it's a three year hundred and thirty million dollar deal. When the Mets traded him, there was like sixty million left. The Rangers only have to pay twenty two and a half million dollars for Max Scherzer, so he's out the rest of this season. He did pitch well in his eight starts. He's out the rest of this season. Twenty two and a half million next year. I'm still calling this a steal for the Rangers. Do you disagree? Not at all. No, and, and I I think Rangers fans right now the mood should be disappointment and not frustration because I I, I say this every year. Uh, even if it blows up in your face like the way it has for Max's former team, the Mets, this year, I will always, always, always credit an organization that fucking went for it. You looked at what you had at the deadline and you said, yeah, I know we kind of like our farm system. We think we can do it this year. Let's trade for Scherzer. Let's trade for Montgomery. Let's go out and get Araldis Chapman. Let's try to build a team that can win a World Series. Now, right now, given the injuries and especially the inconsistency, the Rangers have been, you know, they, now they've played well in the series against the Blue Jays, but they've had their struggles. At the same time, I don't, yeah, I think that you, ha when that win now window is open, you take advantage of it. There's always going to be instances in which it backfires, but I don't, like, I know a lot of Mets fans were kind of like da dancing on the grave and I get it. Like that's fandom. At the same time, I think from a Rangers standpoint, I think Chris Young and the powers that be within that organization make that move a hundred times out of a hundred. It sucks that he got injured. That is the one downside that comes with acquiring a player in his late thirties with a lot of city miles on him. It's like, you don't know what version of them you're going to get. It seemed like they got a good version of them, but durability is always an issue at that age. Well, yeah, it was a big 
part of the trade was making sure that Max opted into his player option next year. So he will be a member of the Texas Rangers potentially for his final season, which is crazy to say, because I don't remember baseball without Max Scherzer at this point. But um, yeah, really difficult break. Sucks to see. I love Max Scherzer. He's one of my favorite pitchers of all time. So it's uh, it's a, it sucks that we're going to be without that storyline come October and it absolutely, you know, diminishes or, or, or you know, thins that Rangers uh, staff out a lot. But yeah, I, I I don't think they have any regrets about making those. Yeah, present moment, I think they're a game back, or they're tied or a half game back. The AL West is three dog race right now with the Seattle Mariners, the Astros, and the Rangers. The Rangers have won five in a row at the time of reporting. The Rangers look very hot. The Rangers are in Cleveland, who's been utterly atrocious. They have one more game in Toronto tonight, then they're in Cleveland Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On Monday, who do you think is going to be in first place in the AL West? Let me repeat this. On Monday, who do you think is going to be in first place in the AL West? Seattle is three at the Dodgers. The Astros are in Kansas City. The Rangers are in Cleveland. Again, well, the Rangers have been hot. Cleveland has been atrocious. I, I, I gotta go. I gotta go. Houston, just because I, I Kansas City. Come on. I, I mean, I know that I know that the Astros have had their inconsistencies and their struggles, but. I uh, I think going to KC now they did just lose two out of three in Oakland so I might be you know, or at or at home against Oakland so I could be I could be uh, wrong there but I I think the Astros will be in first place in that in that uh, division come Monday yeah it'll make our power ranking show very interesting but I think they're in good shape yeah I have been really out on the Rangers for the last week or so but the lineup for the last three weeks of the season. You know, if it was the playoffs, I'd lean into pitching. I want the hotter pitching. But for the last three weeks of the season, I would want the better lineup. And the Rangers have a better lineup than the other two teams in the division. Right now, I got the Mariners as the odd man out. I think George Kirby cursed them. I mean that. It's it's possible. They're, they're such a weird team because they had a month in which they were the best team in baseball. And they still have, I would say, of this entire division, maybe the best player in Julio Rodriguez. But yeah, I mean, they've they've blown some games recently. They blew a they had an opportunity against the Angels a few nights ago where they the game was handed to them and they couldn't take it. Uh, I mean, I would say God, it's tough from a roster standpoint. I think the Mariners have the the weakest roster of the three teams. I like their pitching staff, but you know, there's still question marks to the offense. I, I you know, the Rangers and Astros have some you know are loaded with talent. Um, you might be right. You, it, it could have just been one of those teams that got crazy hot for a month. I, you know, we can't as disappointing as it is, we can't overlook how impressive of a job the Rangers have done going to Toronto and just slapping the shit out of them these first three games. I mean, I know they got they got Gosman going tonight. Toronto does, but really impressive showing by them to kind of bounce back after just an ugly month, the kind of month that derails a season. Um, you know, even with the injuries and stuff, it seems like they're starting to get back on track a little bit. Wouldn't be surprised if they cracked that top nine in our power rank. In classic Toronto Blue Jays fashion, Hubs get called slapped. it. Yeah, yeah, they suck. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm starting to be more and more out on them, but I, I can't quit them just because I know how talented they are, but I'm with you. Let's stay in the East because the Rays and the Orioles have a four-game series that starts tonight. There's a two-and-a-half game difference right now. I think the Orioles are really hanging on for life now, clinching their mm-hmm. butt cheeks with Felix Bautista out. Uh, Rays 7-3 and three over their last 10 Again, the more we talk about Wander Franco getting out of that clubhouse and the juju and the energy, which some people on Barcelona Baseball do not agree with. I'm a big promoter of juju and energy coming out of a clubhouse. So let me let me just say this about this weekend series. Obviously, huge implications. We could wake up on Monday and the Rays could be in first place. The Orioles could be hosting a wild card weekend, which would be insane with how good they've been over the last two months. The pitching matchups, game one. Savali Bradish, two, Eflin Flaherty, three, Glasnow Grayson, and then the last mm. one, Little, should be a little bit of a bullpen day versus uh, Dean Kramer. Line, I mean, though I like those matchups. I watching the Orioles the last few days because one thing that's impressed me about them all year is that I've never felt like they've heard the footsteps. They just kind of keep rolling. Even if the Rays keep winning, they're, hey, it's four, they're up four games, they're up three games, you know, pressure's on, doesn't feel like the pressure's on. The last two nights against a bad Cardinals team, they struggled to score runs, they got shut out last night, they let Adam Wainwright get a win on him, and Wainwright hadn't gotten a win in three months. Man, I want, I want the Orioles to win this division. 
I'm starting to get a sinking feeling they're going to blow this. And it's not even so much blowing this as much as it's like, I I feel like it's they've had many an opportunity to kind of really take hold of this division, and they have it in large part because the Rays just haven't broke. Like, I keep waiting for them to break. They haven't. I think the Rays are playing the best baseball that they've played since the beginning of the season. You bring up those pitching matchups. Glass now, like, all my criticism of him, he's looked fucking great the last month or so. I mean... Look, they have three legitimate starters now with him, Savali, and Eflin. All of them are pitching in this series. Uh, you worry about the thinning of that Orioles bullpen without Batista. I'm rooting for Baltimore. Like, I'll just straight up, you know, maybe I shouldn't have allegiances. I do. Um, but I'm uh, I'm starting to get worried there. This is a this is the biggest series that's been played at Camden Yard since the uh, ALCS in 2014. I mean, this is a huge, huge moment uh, for this ball club. If they, if they win this series and win this division... It justifies the lack of moves that they made at the deadline. But if Flaherty goes out there and gets a shit kicked in, we're we're the first thing we're talking about when we bring up this team on Sunday is yeah, you should trade it for a fucking starter, a legitimate starter. Uh, because the the team on the other end lost a million pitchers and still might have a better staff than you do. So this is the most intriguing series maybe of the year so far. Yeah, it's an opportunity for Orioles fans to talk shit back to us because this is wow. really where you can identify you're going up against playoff caliber pitching in a must-win series by all measures. You know, so can Grayson go pitch against Tyler Glass now? Maybe. We're going to find out. He's been better later. Aaron Savali. You know, is he way better than Jack Flaherty? You bet your fucking ass. The Rays went and got him. Flaherty's the guy the Orioles got. So there's some some really good underlying stories here. You know, Bradish, is he going to be is is the rust there, or do you seize the moment? So for an Orioles fan, so many things are colliding emotionally, sentimentally as you come to this series. It could be fucking absolute ground zero doomsday on Monday for Orioles fans. This could go very south this weekend. However, they could sweep them. If I had to bet on one, I would bet on the Orioles sweeping just because it's the 2023 Orioles, and all they've done is surprise everyone in baseball. So mm-hmm. now would be a great time for them to come back and be like, actually, you guys are wrong. Here's a perfect example of how you're wrong. So this could be, a, like you said, what did you say, the best? The best this series be, of the year? The most compelling series the, of the year? Yeah, the most intriguing, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about these teams forever. Um, and and the, the Orioles have checked off every box at every checkpoint this season. This is kind of the last one where it's like, if you get past, if they win three out of four, win this series, it's it's their division. Like, they'll have done the fucking thing when they were, I mean, preseason, a lot of them had them fourth, fifth place. So I'm rooting for them. I, I hope they they come through with it. I really do. Would you bring Felix Bautista back if you're the Orioles? Now, keep in mind, he's not a free agent until 2028, not arbitration eligible till 2025. It kind of seems like you need him real bad. He's been throwing even though he's on the IL. He's 28 years old. Would you bring him back this year? Yes. And then oh, well, have the, him have okay. surgery in the offseason? Yeah. The The first thing I would do is I'd legitimately ask him, do you feel like you're good enough to pitch at the yeah, level? Yeah, assume that he you... can pitch. Yeah, fuck, fucking assume, assume all that shit. Don't get, oh, we yeah. don't need to be playing. Like, assume he can pitch, but the trade-off is he's out all next year. He's got to have surgery. Yes, I'm still doing I, and I I because I just don't like it at all when teams make this assumption of, I know it sucks, but we're going to get back there. You never know if you're going to get back there. You know, the prime example is is Strasburg in 2012. And they're like, you know, they they had this this mentality of, all right, we've had a great year. We're going to shut down Strasburg. Yeah, it might fuck us in the playoffs, but don't worry about it. We'll get back there. It took them seven years just to win a playoff series. Now, of course, it worked out. Grand scheme of things, like Strasburg was incredible in 19. But it's the principle of that. I think you, you make a mistake. I felt this way at the deadline with them, too. When you assume... This is the beginning. You never know. You never know who's going to stay healthy. You never know who's going to get traded, uh, what other teams are going to pop off and get hot. This is, I think, a golden opportunity for them. And really, they don't, like, let's be real, they don't win the pennant if Batista's not closing games. Like, they can do, they can maybe win a playoff series possibly, but at some point, this core in their in the back end of their pen, which has been responsible for so many close wins this season, 
I mean, the impact of that is greatly diminished without Batista there. So I, I think for if you if you can get him at you know the best possible strength that you can get him, yeah, I'm pitching him the the latter part of this season into October. You got to. Yeah, the upside at the end of the year versus the downside for all of next year because you can offset that in the offseason. You can you can patchwork a bowl, but you can figure out a way to at least try and replace his value in the offseason. I mean, it's the Orioles. They're not going to do it because it's the Orioles, but at least you have that opportunity in the offseason. If you know and there's hypothetical, okay, pitch this year, try and take advantage, win a World Series. I agree with you. I don't think they have a chance to win a World Series. They could win the pennant. I think the American League is balanced enough. They could that they could win the. I think that they would. You're at a huge disadvantage if you have to grind that bullpen through October and then get to a World Series against. You know, you show up and you're staring at the Atlanta Braves without Bautista would be a fucking impossible. But I think they could sneak their way, especially if they win the division. Bautista's fucking the the contract situation. Is he's I shouldn't say I my language. He's primed to be fucked by the Orioles because of his contract situation and because of his age. Because going into arbitration, if they ride him into the playoffs and then they have him injured next year, they're gonna go into arbitration and sandbag him and be like, he's coming off injury. You know, he's pitched, I think, three hundred and fifty career professional innings at this point before the injury, two hundred and forty games. We're talking about like ten nine, ten seasons here. So the argument against his durability, I can totally see the Orioles doing that to sandbag him and do everything they could not to pay him. They'd probably fucking love for him to get injured. It's a shitty front office. I shouldn't say it like that. It's not a shitty front office. It's a shitty organizational culture. I should not yeah. say that. I apologize. I apologize. Orioles fans are mad at me right now. Pound sand. Um, speaking of young players, Pete Crow Armstrong made his debut for the Cubs. I just want to point this out. It, he looks a little overmatched. He looks a little slight. He Also... I've got Grady Sizemore, Jacoby Ellsbury vibes, but the argument I made for him to play executed right away. They bring him up, they have him go against Chris Flexen, below average righty on the road against Colorado. 0 for 4, but some positives in his plate appearances. And then they followed him up, started him, ran him out against a lefty the next day. Because the Cubs have used Mike Talkman against righties. But mm-hmm. he does not play against lefties. They do not have a center fielder for lefties. They've been trying Cody Bellinger back out there and making Candy play for his base. Candy's a butcher. He's on the IL. And you have to figure for a playoff series, you put your best defense out there first. Like, I don't think I don't think you would play Candy in a playoff scenario in the field. I think in most must-win games, you'd have Cody Bellinger at first base. But the Cubs have only started Mike Talkman this season, I think, Seven of his 73 starts have been against a left-handed pitcher. So, like, what the evidence there is saying they don't want him out there against lefties. So, the thinking is, like, all right, well, they're bringing Pete Crow up here. Like, they're probably going to run him out against lefties and righties. And if the kid just takes off, he's 0 for 8. He looks a little overmatched. I'm interested to see how long the Cubs are willing to ride this. That said, defensively, he's already made a play in the outfield where everybody was like, holy fuck, this dude can go get it. So, I guess, what would you do? With Pete Carl Armstrong relative to his Dave Ross said he goes, We're not developing players at this point in the season, but so and so his immediate MLB development as the Cubs pursue uh uh October baseball here. Man, it, it's really tough and I, I think it's one of those things you play it by ear and see how he performs. It's why I do really like calling up prospects in September because I think that they can, even if they struggle for those few weeks a month, I don't think it's some crazy hit on their confidence that can come back the next year. I think right now you clearly, you have a player that can, especially what by the time you get to October, that can impact positively help your team in many ways. This is a, a, a major league ready gold glove caliber center fielder already. I mean, he's going to be a tremendous defensive outfielder, good base runner, good speed. The question will be the bat. Obviously I think that he'll play a role on this team uh, assuming they make it to October, which they're going to. I think he'll play a role on this ball club uh, in some capacity in October. I It may be more of a situational, pinch-hitting, defensive replacement type of uh, scenario. Uh, but if the bat going, gets going a little bit, then you could be talking putting him in the bottom of the lineup. That's a lot to bet on when you have two weeks left in the season for a guy to kind of find his footing that quickly at the big league level. Um, but, you know, I think with the rosters expanding, he'll... There, he'll be a contributor in some capacity, whether it's just defensively, just pitch running, 
Um, the, even people who lauded this guy as a prospect acknowledge the bat will kind of be the last thing to kind of come along. The defense and the base running speed is all there. Uh, I think we'll probably see that at the big league level uh, too, but it, he'll be a factor. He, it, they'll need him to be a factor. Yeah, at the very least, the huge benefit he brings, whoever plays in center field is going to be better than right now. Because if he if he earns the position from Talkman, then it's because he's a better option. Now, if he stumbles and they take him out, Mike Talkman has got a big chip on his shoulder. If they let that kid go out for the next week or two with consistent playing time, especially against right-handed pitching, it's only going to take two or three starts in a row from Pete Crow Armstrong against a right-handed starter for Talkman to get really fucking mad. And I love an angry baseball player down the stretch who's like, dude, I've, I'm the one who's been here while we've picked up and gone. I'm the one that's allowed us to go play Cody Bellinger at first base. Now that we're down the stretch, you guys are going to fuck me? I don't think so. And I think Talkman, 32 years old, kicked around, cup of coffee in Korea, you know, coming from the Yankees. This is a guy who's been through some shit, hometown kid, went to friend, Bradley University. Like, that's a huge opportunity to put an organ, like a real natural chip on a player's shoulder. And I wouldn't put the Cubs, they're pretty, di- I think like Jed Hoyer's trained by Theo. He's diabolical enough to be like, hey, if we give Pete opportunities, it's going to make Talkman better if it, if it ends up going back to Talkman. I'm smiling because does Mike Talkman not sound like the name of somebody who goes nuts in October and one day becomes a great dozen trivia question? Like the guy who in the, in the NLDS goes 10 for 20. And then we just remember, dude, do you remember the Mike Talkman series? They batted him like eighth and he would like hit like three home runs. I think of what journey, I'd like to see it too. Journeyman, like this guy's been fighting for playing time his entire career. Like nothing has ever been guaranteed to this guy. Even when he's played well, nothing's been guaranteed to this guy. So I think in a weird way, I kind of like the way you're going with that. This could work to the advantage of the team for both of these players because both you have both guys or you have one guy fighting for more playing time. You have one guy who's fighting to establish playing time in Talkman. Uh, you know, could be a kind of a, a, a puppeteer, you know, Jed Hoyer being the puppeteer here, seeing the strings could be something that works out, uh, for Chicago potentially if, if, if that bat really gets going. Mike Talkman, underrated baseball player, Mike Talkman, underrated baseball player. I like underrated baseball players. Now, last thing I have for us here, just a random stat on the subject of underrated. Let's go overrated. I said at the trade deadline, I think it was crazy the way people were talking about Lucas Giolito. I thought it was crazy. Who's going to get Giolito? Are you going to be in the mix for Giolito? Who's getting Giolito? The Orioles didn't get Giolito. Giolito, in his last 12 starts, uh, teams 1-12. and 12. He's been uh, he's been the worst pitcher in baseball in the second half. And, with, and not bad luck, either. I mean, we're talking ERA pushing like 7. Um, who? I guess just to kind of ask the question, who, what deal does he get now? Like, it, does he get... I. I Will he get a multi-year deal? You can't, can you? I would sign a one-year deal if I was him, and I would go play for the Rays. I'd take one, you know, one year, eight million, go down to Tampa, get your mind right, and then go sign that four-year, 90 million, you know, extension with somebody, with the Twins. Well, I was thinking as a West Coast guy, the Dodgers try to do what they did with Cindergard, where it's like, let's take a one-year flyer on a guy, see if he can fix himself. We've seen them do that with guys in the past. It obviously didn't work with Cindergard, but I could see them being like, fuck it, fifth starter, one year, eight mil, see if he can figure something out here. Um, you know, they have that they have a magic pitching factory as well. Um, maybe San Francisco, you know, if he pulls a uh what Gosman did and Gis Di Selfani and these guys, where it's like, hey, they've turned multiple veteran pitchers' careers around. That park is really huge. Um, I could see him maybe succeeding there if he can fix his changeup. I'm not sure, but he's been, I mean, woefully ineffective, doesn't even do it justice. He's been completely, he's basically unpitchable the second half. If San Francisco wants to sign you, you should sign with San Francisco. That's the type of analytics their front office have. If they're approaching you in the off season, it's because they know something about you that you don't. And they would like to turn you into an all-star. Kevin Gossman talked about an interview we had with him last year. I'd recommend people go check that out if you can find it. Or I don't know. Maybe I'll tweet the link out. Honestly, I got a lot of my plate right here. This is the Barstool Baseball Friday show. Chris, headlines. I think we did a good job getting through some of the biggest stuff going on in baseball. Anything we missed? <laughs> yes. 
probably at the time of recording, there's still some baseball that has to be played today. So if there's some stuff we missed, we're sorry, but this is the Barcelona baseball show. We're hanging on by a thread. We're doing the best we can, right? Oh yeah. No, this is going to be fun. We're, 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 we're in the witching hour of the season heading into October. This is going to be dope. Yeah. We'll come back with some roster wars when the playoff picture gets uh, a little bit sharpened up. For now, just do us a favor. Subscribe to the channel. We'll have some playoff stuff coming. And until next time, we very much appreciate you guys. Thanks for tuning in.